Honorable Richard M. Nixon, former Vice President of the United States and leader in the Republican Party. From New York City, the American Broadcasting Company brings you Issues and Answers. Our guest, Mr. Richard M. Nixon, will be interviewed by ABC Capitol Hill correspondent Bob Clark and ABC political editor Bill Lawrence. Mr. Nixon, uh, normally Bob Clark and I would be asking you all the questions. Today, however, we have a third member of the panel. He's not going to ask any questions. But I think he's going to raise some issues that you may want to answer. I... Yeah, I do not want to get in a debate uh, on uh, a foreign policy meeting in Manila with a chronic campaigner like Mr. Nixon. He, uh, he, it's his problem to find fault with his country and with his government during a period of October every two years. And if you look back over his record, you'll find that true. He never did really recognize and realize what was going on when he had an official position in the government. You remember what President Eisenhower said, that he'd take, if you'd ask, give him a week or so, he'd figure out what he was doing. Mr. Nixon, uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, I noted that President Eisenhower issued a statement from Gettysburg yesterday in which he said that uh, I was the best informed vice president that the country had ever had. And so the question is the credibility of Lyndon Johnson or the credibility of Dwight Eisenhower. I think the great majority of the American people, Democrats and Republicans alike, would say that the Eisenhower credibility is infinitely higher than Lyndon Johnson's credibility. Well, what about the meat of the president's criticism, though? That uh, you're well, the a meat chronic of the campaigner who finds fault every two years. The, the meat of the president's criticism is that he did not answer the questions. Uh, I asked some questions, some questions that were very important to uh, the lives of American fighting men in Vietnam. Uh, as to whether we were going to have an increase in the number of forces to 500,000, 600,000, or 700,000, as some administration sources have indicated, or whether we were going to do what the Republicans have recommended, that is, to increase our air and sea stri strikes against North Vietnam. Uh, he declined to answer these questions, and then he engaged in what I thought was a rather, uh, well, uh, a personal attack uh, which is not worthy of the President of the United States. Now, let me say this. Uh, this attack isn't going to gag me. Uh, as you may remember, Bill, uh, I was never one that could be arm-twisted by anyone and frightened even by the towering temper of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he has a perfect right to call me a chronic campaigner, uh, but I would just point this out for the record. I don't think any American, and I would say no Democrat, has defended our policy in Vietnam more effectively than I have in every capital of the world. I've defended it in Paris. I've defended it in London. I've defended it in Rome. I've defended it in all the capitals of Europe. I've defended it all over Asia. I've defended our policy all over the United States. And while President Johnson was in Manila, I did not criticize, I did not even comment about Vietnam, and I defended our policy against the attacks that Bobby Kennedy made on Premier Key at that time. Uh, now, he can call that uh, chronic campaigning. Uh, I would simply suggest that the voters, the American people, are fair-minded. And uh, I think as they look at the president, maybe they will think that he was a tired man uh, and perhaps was engaging in some uh, ra verbal abuse, uh, which, uh, after he thinks of it, he would wish that he hadn't done it. You have, as you point out, generally supported the president on Vietnam, and you've said that Vietnam should not be an issue in this election. Have your differences now widened to the point where you feel that Vietnam policy should be a major election issue? Bob, our policy should not be an issue. If you're talking about policy in terms of the great goal of no reward for aggression, here the Republicans give the Johnson administration the support that his own party denies him. And let the record show he's the first president in history who has been unable to unite his own party behind a war. Never happened before. But insofar as the means to achieve that goal, uh, how do we get this war over with, uh, rather than letting it drag on for five years, which this president administration's policy would let it do? 
uh, on that particular point, that is a legitimate subject for debate. And that was what my question was directed to. You said in your statement yesterday that the president, uh, in his attack on you, has struck at the very roots of the right of dissent. Do you think that the president is deliberately trying to silence his critics on Vietnam? Well, if the president of the United States uh, attacks me, uh, one who has supported his policy, uh, supported it around the world, one who has answered critics, uh, stood up against hostile pickets all the way from Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia uh, to the college campuses of the United States, uh, then certainly that's going to frighten others who have more to risk than I have. Uh, uh, I think President Johnson, and I have great respect for him, for his political ability, uh, I've known him as you gentlemen have during the years we've known in Washington. Uh, but on the other hand, I think President Johnson uh, tends uh, to have an attitude that unless everybody goes all the way with LBJ, uh, then it's none of the way. Uh, he isn't going to get away with that with me, and he shouldn't get away with that with his own party. Uh, I believe that you need to have dissent. And I would say that a policy that condemns American boys to fighting the kind of a war that is in the interests of the communists, a ground war, a one that's going to cost us more casualties than in Korea, I say that that kind of a policy needs discussion. It needs criticism. And President Johnson ought to listen. He ought to listen and answer questions rather than to indulge in that rather kind of cheap political demagoguery that he, we saw a moment ago. <coughs> well, Mr. Nixon, uh, you say you support him, yet you say that present policies would keep the war going five more years, cost more casualties in Korea, the real basic heart of the Manila communique would turn the country over to the communists. Did it ever occur to you that Mr. Johnson's reaction to these harsh criticisms might match that old Hungarian expression with a friend like this who needs an enemy? The difficulty with Mr. Johnson's position is that he, uh, he rejects the whole concept of bipartisanship. Uh, you recall, Bill, when we first met 20 years ago, the Vandenberg-Truman uh, bipartisanship, where Vandenberg, together with Harry Truman and Dean Acheson and others, created the great ideas, the Greek-Turkish uh, uh, program, and then later on, of course, uh, that led to the Grand Alliance, the Marshall Plan. Now, how did this come about? It came about by reasonable men disagreeing, and disagreeing very strongly about means, but agreeing on the goals. We're talking about means here. And as far as the com uh, Manila communique is concerned, what happened here is that, w it was a, that we are reaping the consequences of instant diplomacy, a trip that was hastily planned. Uh, Foster Dulles used to say, you should never go to the summit. You've heard him say this, unless you have it well prepared in advance. And Lyndon Johnson planned this trip. He rushed out to Manila. Uh, they get out of communique. It served a useful purpose in getting our allies together uh, and in reassuring them, and I was glad that the president representing the American people received such a wonderful reception all over Asia. But let the record show that as far as the communique is concerned, it is a booby trap on if the communists should accept it, because what it says is that in the event that they withdraw their forces from South Vietnam, and, and I quote, the violence subsides, we will withdraw our forces within six months. 10,000 miles away. That means that all that we fought for could be lost because then the Viet Cong, who would continue to be supported logistically by the North Vietnamese, would have the upper hand over the South Vietnamese. We just simply can't leave that kind of an offer outstanding. Uh, this is a diplomatic booby trap, and President Johnson should withdraw this particular offer, if it is an offer, or clarify it at the earliest possible time. That's what I suggest they do. Now, this is, this is not carping criticism. This is in the interest of saving American lives. It's in the interest of seeing to it that the, that the Americans who have died, and we've had 35,000 casualties in Vietnam, uh, 6,000 dead and the rest wounded and missing, that they don't die in vain. And I'm going to speak up. I don't care what Lyndon Johnson says. If we can take a short pause here, we'll be back in just a moment with more issues. Mr. Nixon, Secretary McNamara had a meeting yesterday in Texas with the President, and he said after that meeting that there will be further increases in our troop commitments in Vietnam, but the rate increase will be slower than it's been this year. Will that make you happy? Well, looking at uh, Secretary McNamara's statement, 
uh, what concerned me is the way that statement was interpreted and the way it was uh, headlined around the country. I have here the headline from the morning uh, paper here in, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, let me show it to the television camera, if I may. That one over there I has it. This says, LBJ election e move. Cut back in Viet, comma, and draft. Now, what does that mean to the average reader? Uh, the average reader who doesn't read the fine print in the policy or the fine print in the McNamara communique. What it means is that the American people, millions of Americans who have their sons in Vietnam or whose sons may go there or their loved ones, will think that we're going to cut back on our forces in Vietnam. What the McNamara announcement really means is this. At the present time, we have 340,000 troops in Vietnam. This year, we had an increase of 200,000 in Vietnam. All he said there was that we wouldn't increase next year by as much as we did this year. And I interpret that to mean that there will be over 500,000 American troops in Vietnam next year. Now, he ought to say that. He ought to say that now. And I would also say this. Uh, I respect Secretary McNamara, along with Secretary Rusk, as the two ablest members of the President's cabinet. I have not been among those Republicans who have uh, criticized uh, either of them and have called for McNamara's resignation. But let me say this, that I think that Lyndon Johnson, uh, by bringing Secretary McNamara down to the ranch uh, and then using him as a political prop, that he has impaired the integrity of the Office of Secretary of Defense. I think that uh, Jim Forrestal, Secretary Forrestal, would turn over in his grave if he thought that this office, which is supposed to be above politics, would be used for this kind of political uh, fakery, and that's what it is. Mr. McNamara also announced yesterday that draft calls will be lower for the next four months. Are you suggesting that uh, making that announcement at this time carried a political motive of some sort? Well, in view of the McNamara record on his predictions, and incidentally in his own press conference, uh, he had a Freudian slip, slip I think, when he said that uh, his predictions had not proved too good on this in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Mr. McNamara is the same man, uh, again in a political context, who two years ago said, and I quote, uh, that virtually all of the American military personnel would be out of Vietnam within 16 months. And so when he says that draft calls are going to be down over the next four months, I don't think the American people can believe that any more than they can believe it. His track record, I think, doesn't bear him out. Let me say this. Secretary McNamara, when it comes to running the Defense Department, is an efficient Secretary of Defense. But when he takes off his hat as Secretary of Defense and becomes Lyndon Johnson's Charlie McCarthy, his political stooge, uh, in order to make a political announcement, uh, then Secretary McNamara, I think, loses much of his credibility. And I, and I hope that tomorrow, uh, before the people vote, he himself will clear this up and say, yes, uh, the headlines across the country are wrong. I did not mean that we were going to decrease the number of American men. I do not mean that the decreasing the draft means we're going to have less men in Vietnam, but actually we're going to increase the number of men to over 500,000. That is this administration's answer in Vietnam. Well, you have called in recent weeks for an increase of 25 percent in the total ground forces we have in Vietnam. I Bob, let me correct you. Uh, I understand. I, I, I called for that in August. In August, we had 300,000 in Vietnam, and I called for a 25% increase, which would raise it to 400,000. I believe you repeated that call in mid-September, speaking in Washington. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But, uh, you, but you understand. You, you, At that time, we had 300. We're up to 400,000. And then later, I have made it clear that I believe that now that we've come to 400,000, and I made that suggestion because I feel that's where we should be, we should not now continue to go the road of more ground forces. You see, this administration is talking not only about 500,000, but some administration sources have talked about 600,000. Uh, one Pentagon source three months ago indicated three quarters of a million. That's the wrong road. 400,000 is as much as we should have there. What we now need to do is to use more air and sea power against more targets in North Vietnam. And in this McNamara press conference, he dodged that question. He said that was a military security matter. Well, of course, the targets we hit will be a military security matter, but the Republicans have made it clear, and the issue is clear. If you want to fight this war on the ground, if you want to increase our forces from the 400,000 that I have recommended, and which we will reach by the end of this year, 
uh, to 500,000, as Secretary McNamara indicates, that's one way. That's their way. But if, on the other hand, the American people say, no, we're going to use our strength, our air and sea power against mortar targets in North Vietnam, they should elect more Republicans to the House and Senate. Mr. Nixon, you, a few days ago, you called for a Republican-Democratic political powwow after the election to talk about Vietnam. Is this really the kind of an issue that can be settled within the framework of partisan politicians? Bill, I would never have called for such a uh, powwow, uh, as you call it, uh, except for the fact that at the present time, uh, we have the most servile Congress uh, that we've had in history. Uh, this, incidentally, is not my interpretation. Uh, uh, Larry O'Brien, in a move that I'm sure he thought was going to, to help uh, uh, the president, uh, took time off from delaying the mails the other day to issue a political announcement. Uh, and, and he said that this, that this Congress had a record, the highest percentage of voting all the way with the President of any Congress in history, 90%. He thought that was good. But what I'm suggesting is this. All the wisdom isn't in Lyndon Johnson. All the wisdom isn't in the Republican Party. All the wisdom isn't in the Democratic Party. What I do know is that our present policy can lead us to disaster because if we're in Vietnam, Bill, five years from now, as we've said, I think, in this program before with you, at that time, we run the risk of a confrontation with a communist China that will have nuclear weapons they can deliver. We must avoid this. The way to avoid it is to do what General Eisenhower has recommended, and that is to use maximum military power against North Vietnam to shorten the war and to bring them to the conference table. This is the difference. Now, the purpose of this powwow is to get that kind of new thinking into the consciousness of the President of the United States. And I believe that if he sits down with Republicans and Democrats, maybe we'll get a new policy. Well, as you point out, General Eisenhower says, we said recently that we should put in whatever military strength is needed to win in Vietnam. And yet, you want to stop, hold the line on commitment of ground troops at 400,000. Isn't there a little discrepancy here in what you're saying and the, and the Eisenhower proposal? Bob, I think you have to read the Eisenhower proposal in the context of the report, Republican Coordinating Council's uh, recommendation in December of this year. And as you know, he is a member of that council, and he was present at this meeting. And that council recommended uh, that we should put more emphasis on air and sea power, which is where we are strong, uh, rather than more emphasis on ground power. What I am suggesting here is this. I'm not suggesting an absolute ceiling of 400,000. We have to do what is necessary. But I am suggesting that the administration relies almost exclusively on more and more manpower. That's their kind of a war. And they'll bleed us right. Whereas the Republicans say, let's hit more military targets in North Vietnam. That will shorten the war. And that's what President Eisenhower has been talking about. More military targets in North Vietnam, more air power, more sea power. Mr. Nixon, I'm sure we could spend the next five years talking about Vietnam without solving it. Let's hope it's over by that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk some politics at home. What are the Republicans going to do this year? Bill, I'll stick with the figures that we talked about when I was last on this program with you alone. Uh, I believe we're going to have the biggest Republican gain across the country in any off-year election since 1946. And uh, in numbers, I, I stick with the figures of uh, a net gain of 40 in the House, a net of three in the Senate, six uh, governors, and uh, 700 state legislators. Now, I could be off a few, uh, but I think it's going to be in that magnitude. You don't think you'll be off on the optimistic side, though? You'll probably be on the other side? No, it could be. Uh, well, take the House. Uh, the House is going to be very close, and when you're on election eve, uh, you're going to have great difficulty in saying what the House is going to be because the count always comes last for the House, as you know. They count the governors and senators first. Uh, and uh, I believe they're going to be at least 15 or 16 very, very close races. I think in the House we could win as many as 48. Uh, I think we could win as few as 32. But uh, there are about 18 or 16 swing districts that could go either way. I have a feeling that it'll be 40. And I think the swing is more likely to be our way than their way. But this is where I could be wrong. Do you see any chance of winning the House at all? No, Bill. Uh, I know that uh, my good friend Everett Dirksen, and he's a shrewd observer, has talked, as you know, in terms of 55 or 60, which would almost win the House. Uh, but to win the House would take a landslide of major proportions. I do not see that. 
I do see the best gains, however, ever made uh, in a president's first term after his election uh, in 30 years. Uh, let me point this out. Uh, there, there's been a lot of numbers game going on here about what is a win. And Lyndon Johnson says, well, 60 is uh, the average. Uh, if you look at the presidents who win landslides, you know, uh, they, when you have those shifts, and somebody else has said 40. Actually, it's 10. Because the, the only way you can make this comparison, uh, I think, re uh, fairly, is to take each president when he is most popular, and that's right after he's first elected in his own right. Roosevelt in 34 won nine, uh, gained nine. Uh, Harry Truman in, 40, in 50 after his election in 48 lost 29. Eisenhower in 54 after his election in 52 lost 18. And Jack and, the Congress. and Jack Kennedy and Jack Kennedy in 1964 uh, uh, lost only 62 lost only four. That's an average of 10. Lyndon Johnson will lose three times the average, and he'll lose more than either Roosevelt, Truman, or Eisenhower, or Kennedy, which will make this the greatest repudiation of a president in his first term after his election in the last 30 years. There is a profusion of Republican, potential Republican presidential candidates running this year. We've got Romney in Michigan, Percy in Illinois, and Reagan in California. What is going to happen to the 1968 picture if all three of these men win? Uh, Bob, we're going to have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, it's really great to have uh, not only these men that you mentioned, but others uh, of national stature. I would add uh, to the presidential, vice presidential list, some of the new stars among the new governors around the country. Uh, certainly, Governor Rhodes, who will probably be the biggest winner, uh, will be a strong contender. Uh, you can't rule out men like Volpe in Massachusetts, who will win in a heavily Democratic state. Uh, and uh, you've got to, I think, uh, look across the country and see what's going to happen uh, when Jerry Ford and Mel Laird will have a stronger number of Republicans behind them. I think we're going to have a great number of Republican candidates for president and vice president in 1968. Well, don't you think that this would uh, dim your own presidential prospects somewhat if you've got uh, three or four or five new stars in the Republican skies? You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the elections of 1966 uh, will be a benefit to the winners, and, and the winners are those who run. You know, somebody has asked me uh, whether or not uh, I'm going to get credit if we gain 30 seats or 40 seats. And uh, General Romulo, whom both of you knew, used to say to me, uh, he said, you know, uh, defeat is an orphan, and victory has many fathers. Mm -hmm. All the winners, there'll be plenty of fathers, and if we lose, I'll get blamed. If we can take another short pause here, we'll be back in just a moment with more issues and answers. Mr. Nixon, now that you've toured, toured 35 states, 70 districts, renewed all your political due bills, when are you going to start running for president yourself? Bill, uh, that question is not unexpected, and I'm sure you expect an answer, but uh, let me be quite candid. After these arduous journeys, and they have been arduous with a small staff, I don't have a delegate. I don't have a commitment. Uh, I don't have a staff. I have two secretaries and one research man. I don't have any money. I earn enough, but I have no private fortune. I have no base. I have no office. Uh, and after this election, and this will be an announcement that I'm going to make right now, I'm going to take a holiday from politics for at least six months with no political speeches scheduled, whatever. Uh, what the future holds, I don't know. Uh, I actually meant what I said when I started this campaign. I want to get this party or help to get it unified and get it back on its feet. Uh, then the future will take care of itself. That future may have a part for me in it. Uh, the probabilities are that it will not, because as Bob pointed out, the big winners are those who actually run. Uh, but I will be satisfied, believe me, if the Republican Party is back in business, because if we win as big as I think we're going to win across this country, we can elect our candidate in 1968. I'm sorry that our time is running out. We have enjoyed very much having you with us on Issues and Answers.